You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello from stage eight of the Vuelta España. My name is Richard Moore. I'm not in some Ibiza nightclub, despite the, the beats in the background. I'm standing at the summit of La Camperona, uh, an incredible climb that finishes today's stage. The profile for today's stage pretty much looked like Pinocchio's nose in reverse, just a, a long, straight, flat line, and then straight up at the end, three kilometres uh, of... I'm not going to say vertical because that's not what it is, but 20%, uh, very narrow road, very bumpy at the at the bottom, and uh, and a real a real test for the riders uh, in today's really crucial stage. Um, I'm on my own at the moment. Left Daniel Freib at the foot of the climb by the team buses, so I'm going to try and intercept the riders as they cross the line here in the next 45 minutes or so. The stage is still going on. There's a break with 10 minutes. Uh, looks like one of those guys will win. Um, well, one of those guys will win. Um, but of, of course, what happens behind is is interesting. Um, big day for Darwin Atapuma, who is in the red jersey of race leader. And at the start this morning in Villa Pando, I spoke to his sports director at BMC Racing, Max Chiandri. Here is Max. Max, you must be... Uh, very pleased with how the Vuelta is going so far. You've got a man in the in the red jersey. A big day for him today. Yeah, yeah, it's a big day, you know. And uh, it's actually what we live on. We live on days uh, with uh, with Darwin. You know, he's we came here to the Vuelta with uh, with uh, GC ambition with uh, Samuel, Samuel Sanchez. TJ has a bit of a free spirit in this race. Uh, and Darwin obviously was like uh, you know just trying try, trying to. Uh, nail down a day a, a, a stage win you know like he did in Swiss like we tried in the Giro and now we find the we found the the jersey uh, after a break so it's it's a daily it's a it's a daily plan with him you know and today as you said it's a pretty hard finish uh, especially last two and a half K really really hard you know he's he's motivated he's good he's strong he's got his best uh, numbers everywhere and all the SRM uh, files are so conditions there motivations there and we just have to see. He's uh, he's a Colombian and he's a great climber. Obviously, can he can he hold the jersey today? Yeah, I think today he can hold the jersey. I just see, you know, his, 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 his rival number one right now is Valverde. But I think if if they if they want to look at their their own garden, I think uh, with Quintana it's going to be maybe Valverde a little bit working for him. Uh, Obviously, I think if if the, if the race comes to like a K to go and like the, the the GC contenders are there, then and if Valverde's there, then he can be a, you know he could try and go for the win. He, he he's a smart guy, Valverde. You know, he, he looks he gets the opportunities whenever they come up. You know, so uh, and then for 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 um, Darwin, he's still got a bit of time on the GC leader, so he's got that little cushion and gap what he can uh, try and handle. So, what's he like, Darwin? Is he he seems like a very very so placid character, very, very relaxed. What, what's he like? How does he fit into Super the team? Super down to earth, uh, smiling. He's just like every day. He's like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You know, this jersey obviously has just picked his uh, his whole whole life up in, in you know in good terms, obviously. And he's just really living the moment, living the dream. And, and every day he says to me, you know, like I can't believe uh, the the power it gives me having the jersey. How how good I feel. Like how I can move in the peloton you know and I said that's leadership that's confidence that's mind this mind is connected to body there's a lot of different issues you know just by looking at numbers sometimes so you know he's going through all that fate all these different phases of really enjoying it and uh, hopefully you know we'll be in uh, in the jersey this evening and just finally on Sammy Sanchez I mean he's he's not he's not a young rider and he, but he seems to be going very well and he's come come here as your leader yeah no he's a he's a totally different guy he's very he's one of the most professional guys I wouldn't say the most but one of the most in our team really I remember after I did Burgos with him as as, as, DRS, as DS and he went day after finished Burgos to see two or three stages so he's really prepared it he's uh, he's, he's in a different act than uh, than Darwin he obviously he's gonna he's gonna he's uh, he's not an impulsive rider he, he really he thinks about stuff and 
and he has to be kind of looking at the outside the window, just seeing how our as main, main rivals are going to move, you know. So, unfortunately, yesterday we got caught out by a little bit of a bad moment. <laughs> For, for, for yeah, it's nothing to do with with them and us. It's just like he stopped for for for, for what he had to stop for, and uh, and they just put on the stick, and uh, we had to stop half of the team to just bring him back. You know, we killed a few people, you know. So it kind of unfolded a little bit different than what we expected. We had a in a way a free ride because Trek and other teams were pulling, mm. and then he got caught in the crash with Valve uh, with the uh, Contador, but nothing. He, he had nothing. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. So that was Max Chandri, you're back with me in Ibiza. I should stress, I will be joined by Daniel later on, perhaps another guest too, if we can find Francois Thomas or somebody to join us. But I'll certainly be uh, hooking up with Daniel when the stage has finished. There'll also be Lionel's tale of the Etapa, but as I speak, the Etapa is not finished, so we'll hear that as soon as the, uh, the stage is done. Um, I realise I undersold the, the, the final climb a little bit. It's actually 22% in places near the foot of the climb. Uh, so very, very steep and nasty indeed. Um, Max Chandri there, uh, some people might be surprised to hear that Samuel Sanchez is the team leader. And as I'm watching the big screen here, uh, BMC are on the front, just uh, you know, just controlling things, not, not exactly chasing, but controlling things for Darwin Atapuma. Um, but yeah, Samuel Sanchez, 38 years old. Um, and there are one or two people who fancy him to win the Vuelta, believe it or not. I spoke to our colleague Fran Reyes this morning, the Spanish journalist, and he, uh, he tips uh, Sanchez to really do something quite amazing in this Vuelta, which, which would be extraordinary. And uh, I don't think he's many people's favourites, but we'll see what happens. Um, and we'll see, of course, if Atapuma can hold on to the, the jersey today. It's set to be very exciting and interesting. Uh, uh, not unique, but a very unusual uh, type of climb. It'll be interesting to see if Chris Froome rides it the way he has been riding all the climbs, which has been managing his effort very carefully, sometimes getting dropped near the bottom and coming back. There's not much not much road for him to come back on today. Um, but when they came up here two years ago in 2014, that's exactly how he rode it. Um, managed his effort very carefully there and, and, and rode extremely well. So let's see what happens. It's set to be a thriller. Okay, I've bumped into Eva Marisa at the summit here from Eurosport in Portugal. You commentate and present Eurosport in Portugal, is that right? Hi Richard, yes, uh, indeed. I'm a Portuguese uh, commentator and uh, also some cycling races. Obviously the women's cycling uh, that now is very strong coming up on Eurosport. Also you were at the Tour de France as well. But you came up to me yesterday Eva and you, you gave me a hard time, you reprimanded me for not Having, uh, we haven't featured the Portuguese riders enough, and there are a few of them riding the Vuelta. Tell us who is riding the, the Vuelta from Portugal. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, José Gonçalves, who was a major player last year in the Vuelta, breakthrough, um, you know, uh, Grand Tour for him. It was his uh, maiden Grand Tour, and he was knocking on the door of that win, uh, almost made it. I think, uh, if memory serves me right, it was... Uh, five uh, top five finishes it was an amazing performance yeah. and Machado as well is another one of course yes uh, Tiago Machado who obviously rides for Katusha he will keep riding for Katusha uh, next season uh, Tiago is a very very aggressive rider uh, he defines himself uh, I run on instinct he says that he doesn't look at his you know Garmin at all just at the watts the moment he attacks which is very interesting he's looking for a stage win let's see if it happens for him I hope so He's feeling very good. More generally, Eva, tell us about cycling in Portugal. It's, I wouldn't call it a backwater in terms of cycling, but when we talk about the big cycling countries in Europe, we talk about France and Spain and Italy, Belgium and Portugal and Holland, and Portugal tends to be overlooked. I mean, it, it produces a few good riders rather than lots of, lots of um, you know, professionals. Um, how, how popular is cycling in Portugal? Well, uh, cycling... Uh, it was very popular, I would say, uh, 70s, 80s, early 90s in Portugal. And then we went through a lull, sort of like, you know, the whole doping situation kind of affected cycling in Portugal a lot, uh, especially the national teams. But now it's up on the rise. We have great, great um, talents uh, in the World Tour. Uh, Nelson Oliveira is one of them, riding for Movistar, obviously, on his uh, first year, uh, two-year contract. He was uh, a very, very good um, 
acquisition, I would say, for Movistar. He did wonderful in the tour. He's uh, much more than a time trialist. I think he proved that much, uh, you know, standing by uh, Nairo Quintana, uh, not just on the flat. He's very strong on the flat. Also, a very good uh, performer on the classics. Uh, I'm very keen uh, to see what the future has in store for Nelson, who is uh, very, very gradually improving. Um, and he lost a little bit of weight for the tour, obviously, but next season he'll also you know go to Roubaix and Flanders and try his luck there I think that was what Movistar had in in mind when he he was contracted so it's very interesting I don't know if that's your helicopter arriving there Eva I was gonna ask you about the tour reports as well I think that's Daniel Freib's favorite uh, tour he calls it he calls it the hipsters grand tour that probably Daniel arriving actually there he calls it the hipsters grand tour what's the tour of Portugal like well, uh, the Grandissima, yes. Um, oh, there was a golden age uh, for Volta Portugal. Um, now, I think due to its place in the calendar, uh, it's just before the Vuelta. It's hard to attract, you know, the big teams, but uh, it's a very competitive race. I think those who uh, have the chance to, to, to compete in that race, they all come back with the same feedback. It's, it's hard, ultra hard, very complicated climbs, fast paced, uh, uh, very hot temperatures. Um, Eva, where can people find you on Twitter? Well, my handle is uh, Eva Marisa, so um, that's where you can find me. Um, and uh, looking forward to answer any questions you might have about uh, Portuguese riders. Yeah, lots of Portuguese cycling chat there. Thanks very much. We'll uh, speak to you again soon. Thank you, Richard. Well, they're on the climb now. It's uh, Katusha rider Jonathan Restrepo, uh, 21 years old from Colombia, another Colombian. Not a typical Colombian, though. He is is, uh, he's quite, quite bulky. It looks more like a ruler than a climber, but he's away on his own with a decent lead. I'm not sure he'll survive the climb. Let's find out. And behind them, the bunch is, as you would expect, racing to the foot of the the climb uh, as if it's a you know lead out for a bunch sprint. Etics quick step up there. Not not really entirely sure why. Um, Cannondale there, Sky there, obviously. Uh, Orica Bike Exchange there as well, uh, and. Uh, take off uh, quite visible which might bode well for Alberto Contador nursing his crash injuries and bandage up like a, like a mummy today so let's see what happens uh, on this claim to finish well Sergei Lagutin won the stage for Katusha there with a, a late break with three man sprint really for the line I'm not sure many of us expect that. Lower down the mountain, uh, we saw Froome accelerate, Contador go with him. Valverde dropped after Puma's gone. Uh, but Quintana has gone over the top of Froome and is looking extremely good. Hey, lots of sort of uh, shuffling around of the, of the pack in the top 10. But for the comprehensive tail of the etapa, let's go over to Lionel Burney. Over to you, Lionel. Thanks, Richard. Well, you witnessed a cracker today, and it was a day that was all about Nairo Quintana, who took the leader's red jersey from his compatriot Darwin Atapuma on the first mountaintop finish of the race. The stage win went to Sergei Lagutin of Katusha, who was part of an 11-man break that gained almost 11 minutes and still had a big advantage as they hit the final, well, the only climb of the day. Lagutin's teammate Jonathan Restrepo, another Colombian, laid the foundations, getting away on his own on the climb, and it was not until the final couple of kilometres when they reached one of the steepest parts of the climb that Restrepo cracked. That left Peter Seri, Lagutin, Axel Domont and Perry Kemener, who were also part of that 11-man break, to fight out the finish. And it was the veteran Russian Lagutin who got it, dropping Domont and Kemener in the last couple of hundred metres. And that left all of the attention on the GC battle further down La Camperona. Atapuma was in trouble quite early on and the damage at the line was significant. He's now 6 overall, a minute and 36 seconds behind Quintana. Froome accelerated, trying to drop Contador, and he did have Contador in difficulty, but then he fell to the counter-attack from Quintana. Contador recovered too, showing little effect of the crash that he suffered yesterday, and he overtook Froome. It was a real ding-dong battle on the mountain, and at the line, Quintana gained 33 seconds on Froome and now leads Valverde overall by 19. Froome is in third at 27 seconds and Esteban Chavez is fourth at 57. Contador has risen up the classification to seventh at 139. It's another uphill finish tomorrow on the second category Alto di Nananco and Quintana will be in red. 
Gianni Meersman still leads the points competition, Lagutin is now king of the mountains, and Valverde is in the white combination leader's jersey. Back to you on the mountain, Richard. Okay, the riders are sort of arriving at the summit now. I can see just over here a very cool looking Leopold Koenig, the Team Sky rider, who is, well, everybody else, I mean, I just was standing by Chris Froome there, and he was bent over the handlebars heaving and, and in a real state I was told not to speak to him or not try to speak to him um, so I'm going to go I'm going to go over now and try and grab word with Leopold Koenig who is sitting on his bike uh, drinking a, a can of juice looking like he's not just ridden up a very steep climb we're at the summit here um, you look you look you look very fresh yeah I'm fresh <laughs> I'm fresh you know I have uh, 20 races this year so it was a uh, it was all for all, all or nothing here, so uh, I feel fresh and that's, that's important. The legs are there and uh, that, that's, that, that was a little bit worrying me with uh, such a few racing days, but I'm fine. Are you still well placed overall then? I mean, how the, the I don't know how, if you saw what happened up ahead, but Quintana gained a bit of time on Froome, as did Contador, but you still feel pretty confident uh, with still a lot of the race still to come. Uh, I think uh, for me in general is uh, stronger than uh, than Nairo. It was just one day out of the another ten, so uh, you can't judge anything from today. I think it's pretty close. Uh, of course, Quintana showed some strength, so maybe he's going to be the biggest threat to our ambitions. I mean, this is a very particular kind of climb, isn't it? Um, maybe not typical of some of the climbs that will come later. Is it not necessarily? something that we should read too much in today's result. Yeah, it's uh, it's the world of specialty, you know. You, especially for me, it's not a great climb, but uh, we will see, we have one more to go, one more like that in Covadonga uh, uh, or something like that. And then we got some more kind of Alp, uh, Alp stages, uh, kind of tour stages. So let's hope for, uh, for a pure uh, tour stages. So that was Leopold Koenig. Uh, Froome is now giving interviews. I'm going to put my mic in his general direction and try and grab a little bit of what he had to say on a mildly disappointing day for him. But let's hear what he has to say. Yeah, really, really tough, tough climb. Of course, Nairo, Nairo has uh, showed he's in really good condition. Um, yeah, chapeau, he did a... Uh, he did a really good ride today. How did you see the arrivals? Were you surprised by Nairo, but also by Alberto Contador? Yeah, I mean, Alberto did great. I mean, uh, especially after his crash yesterday. Shows that he's uh, he's a fighter and he's, he's come back really strong today. And over here, I can spot Hugh Carthy, the young British rider on uh, Rural team, joining Cannondale draft pack next year. Um, he has been conspicuous by his presence at the rear of the peloton most of the race so far, um, but he rode much better today. Here is Hugh Carthy. Hugh, we're into some of your favourite terrain now. I mean, m maybe not today's climb. How, how did you find that climb today? Uh, well, it wasn't my well, it wasn't my cup of tea to start off with, but uh, no, I've been I've been kind of skulking at the back for the past past week now, so. I wanted to, uh, wanted to try myself out a bit, open myself up and give it a go. And I wanted to try and get in the break this morning to try and, uh, with a view of making it to the finish, but so it's low. It, it wasn't in it and it ran away with, quite easily it ran away, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes, you can't. can't. Are you, as you say, you've been uh, noticeable at, at the back a lot the, the first few days. Has that been a deliberate sort of strategy to, to ride into it a wee bit because the climbs come later? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I don't know. You, I've tried to seek advice coming into the, t into the world too and the advice people are giving me is just better to start off a bit steady and I don't know, maybe I've taken that to the extreme. <laughs> But uh, so it's, it's a better. conservative. Yeah, it's conservative, but at the same time, uh, it is slightly disappointing. Some days when you see the race going up ahead, and you're just thinking, one more day, one more day, and the days do tick by. I mean, it doesn't feel like two minutes ago since we started in Galicia, and now we're starting the ninth day tomorrow. So, uh, and how are you finding your first Grand Tour? Is there anything that sort of puts it on a level above other races other world tour races you've done I think more the uh, the importance of it I think there's a you see going into the climb at the bottom there's, there's guys that haven't wouldn't, don't have a chance of winning on here but they want to give it a go and try and get into the start of the climb first it's 
the race is a matter of pride, it's a matter of, uh, it's the biggest race of the year for a lot of people, myself included, so uh, every second, every second counts, you know, uh, but no, today I felt, I felt good, confident, and I decided to give myself a bit of a test, throw the dice, and wow, I didn't come away too badly, I thought the, the legs were, the legs were okay, and I, on the tough ramps, it was. It's hard to find a rhythm, but uh, no, I, I'm. I feel more confident and happier now, and hopefully, I can. Uh, from here on in, I can give it a give it a shot. Yeah, good health and looking forward to some of the, the high mountains to come. Yeah, that's the main thing. Good health. Uh, I've not had touch wood. I've not had any crashes so far, and not had any illness. We've had a couple of a few incidents of bad luck in the team, nasty crashes, and. We've had a couple of riders nearly wiped out with illness, so uh, no, I'm, I'm fairly happy. Going nearly at the halfway point and not too far from the first rest day, and then uh, now I'll just give it everything before before the rest day, and uh, then take stock, recover, and really, really give it a good shot in the the second the second uh, well the last two thirds of the race, last last third of the race, I suppose. So that was Hugh Carthy, happy, a happy Hugh Carthy, and. Um, oh, there's a fight breaking out behind me by all these things. And, uh, and here's Stephen de Jong, the coach of Alberto Contador at Tinkoff. Alberto obviously obviously hurt today, but he rode very well. He'd be pretty happy. Yeah, no, uh, we are also a bit surprised by his performance today. Uh, he was in a lot of pain this morning and after the warm-up, yeah, he said, OK, it will be better during the ride, but that he could do this today after yesterday, that was, uh, yeah, that was good news. Two more tough days, but um, you must be confident that he'll have an opportunity to recover and, and perhaps be a, a contender in this race. Well, let's hope so. We have to take it day by day now. Today was obviously a very good day. Uh, tomorrow is less hard, the final climb, but the day after is really hard again, so let's hope he does a good performance again there. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast. Of course, uh, they are showing the Vuelta live every day. I've been, I've rejoined, I'm off the mountain. What a palaver that was. And I've, I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Richard. How was your day? Relatively eventful. Well, it was quite a, it was quite a day, wasn't it? Um, you were down, down at the team buses. I was up, up the mountain. What a strange place that was. Um, 1700 meters high, uh, tremendous views up there, and, and it's a lovely sort of small mountain range that we're surrounded by. We're in Leon now, where we're staying tonight, uh, and uh, uh, you heard from various people in the in the first part of the podcast there, including Stephen de Jong, um, surprised at Alberto Contador's performance today. Um, we heard from Hugh Carthy, who showed the first glimmer of, of form, I suppose. He wasn't up there with leaders, but he did okay, and others, and um, it was an exciting day, wasn't it? It was, and it, it started on a very exciting note as well when, well, on a kind of dramatic note when Alberto Contador emerged from his team bus to rapturous applause, which he always gets every day here at the Vuelta. Um, he, well, you were waiting for him there, weren't you? I was, and he was um, taped up with a very patriotic use of kinesio tape, um, red and he yellow very in, colourful, in, in, wasn't in the he? Spanish colours, yeah, big bandages. And gauze on his, I think, on his right arm, a lot of kinesio tape on his left leg, and um, kind of in sort of what's the what's the James Brown, the famous James Brown video where he we pretends need, uh, to we be need Lionel Bernie here yeah, to do his James he, Brown impression, where he comes on stage pretending to be hurt, and I think, is it? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Have you have you witnessed Lionel's James Brown impression? No, I haven't. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, it was quite theatrical. He came out, he got on his turbo trainer, didn't want to talk to the press, but we watched him warm up. And, you know, there were there was some grimaces. He was sort of interacting with the crowd, but he looked very pained. Stephen de Jong, the direct sportif, looked worried. Faustino Munoz, the, the mechanic, looked very worried. And um, at that point, and having spoken to Stephen de Jong, you really didn't particularly expect him to well you, you you thought that he might not even finish the stage let alone the vuelta at that point and let alone perform well in the stage and i was quite astonished to, to see him anywhere near the front um as they started the final climb to la camperona and indeed he performed extremely well didn't he he did i called Stephen de Jong his coach i think he is his coach isn't he, he is a ds at, at tinkoff but he does coach alberto contador an unlikely um partnership in a lot of ways but anyway um 
Condor at the finish as well, still strapped up. You know, after after the stage, he still looked in a lot of pain. He was still moving very stiffly off the bike, a lot of grimacing. Um, so, and he did say that sometimes you're worse two days after a crash. So, you know, playing playing down his chances. But tomorrow's not not quite so hard. And um, this was a real test for him today. And we've seen him at the Vuelta before, um, uh, just right out of his skin, and 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 stage these incredible comebacks. I don't think he's out of it because he might have a chance to recover from these injuries that he's suffered. And, you know, we, we saw today um, Chris Froome, who we thought was in great form and who Francois Thomaso predicted uh, to win today and, and, and sort of cement his place as a favourite. We saw a sort of crack from, uh, you know, it's a, it's a strange climb, isn't it? So let's not read. But Froome, Froome did have a little wobble. Yeah, and I think that is the real sort of brain teaser as far as the welter is concerned. Um, well, it has been both up until now and will be going forward. Uh, just which riders go well on which which climbs? Because I think um, you can almost divide the welter climbs into two categories. You've got this very short, well, quite short, very, very steep, uh, almost walls like we saw today, like we saw the other day in Etzero. And it may just be that different riders thrive on those climbs. And, you know, Esteban Chavez talked about that this morning. Um, he didn't ride particularly well today, didn't uh, fare Expected particularly well. Expected more from him, actually. Expected more from him, but he said that the Welter wasn't going to be won on climbs like the one that concluded today's stage. It was going to be won in, you know, perhaps in on the Orbisque, on the stage finish to Goret. As Koenig told us earlier Yeah, in well. the Pyrenees. And, you know, there are some longer climbs later in the race as well. And, um, yeah, so today I would... I would tread with some kind of caution before we read too much into today's I think result. I think Koenig thinks we're going to the Alps rather than the Pyrenees, if I remember correctly. I think he referred them to them to the, as the Alps. I could be wrong. Um, as long as they're not the Dolomites. <laughs> definitely not the Dolomites. One thing I, I would say, I, I, I described the climb earlier today as first of all 20% then 22%. In fact, I was later told it's 25% in places. I, I don't know. These measurements are difficult, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, as the Spanish newspaper today said that it was... It, classed the Camperona climb second in the all-time list of um, Vuelta climbs, the steepest gradients of Vuelta climbs, 29.3%, I think it said, or um, 28.3%. The, st the steepest ever, according to them, was the Etero climb that we did the other day. One thing that's worth saying, uh, there was a huge crowd on the climb. A lot of them had walked up from the car park at the bottom, um, and they were, after all the trouble at the Tour de France with the crowd, I didn't spot, I might have missed it, but I didn't spot a single uh, incident of a rider, of a, sorry, a spectator running alongside a rider, flags near riders. Um, there was very little interference with the riders. It seemed that the, the spectators really um, stood back, um, applauded their efforts and respected the riders. And that, I think it's worth, worth saying today, that was, they were very well behaved. And um, that is a testament to them and perhaps to the police who were there as well. So well done. Yeah, and again, it was a very spectator-friendly final climb. Certainly, it was always going to be spectacular, um, short. You could pack a lot of people in, and people came from far and wide. And um, again, it, it bears repeating that um, slightly in spite of themselves, but also because of good and clever and astute planning that they've done, the Vuelta organisers have really found their race um, back in the back in a very prominent position in in the calendar and in, in everyone's kind of estimations. I mean, the the course is, is very dramatic. It's very exciting, great field. And, oh, no, we've got a, <laughs> we've got a hen party. We've got a hen party. Got a hen, but not the first time on the Cycling Podcast. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason... Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. Wonderful sponsors that they are. A little reminder that we put out a couple of uh, extras last, last week. One was a, a conversation with Joe Dombrowski at the Rafa Cycle Club in Spitalfields. The other was a conversation with Bradley Wiggins at the Rafa uh, Cycle Club in Soho. So thank, thank you very much to Rafa. Um, Daniel, overall now we've got Nairo Quintana, Quintana first. We've got Valverde second. He's a great fighter, isn't he, Valverde? He was off. He, he sort of Seemed to struggle at the start of the climb, fought his way back, finished with Froome. Um, we've got Froome in third, we've got um, Chavez fourth, and 
Alberto Conde are up to seventh. And what we have is, well, we have Quintana with now a lead on Freeman. He took quite a bit of time out of him today, considering how short the climb was. Um, he's on the front foot, and this is what I said the other day, that he had, he had to be on the front foot in taking on Froome. He looked really happy, actually, at the finish. He was he was smiling very broadly on the on the podium. And um, we've got a, a really interesting race, uh, a really uh, fascinating battle ahead of us, I think. Yeah, and interestingly, I think Froome feels diminished compared to how he was riding at the Tour de France. I asked him at the finish whether um, he felt that... Had he brought his form from July into this race, he would have lost as much time today. He said no, he's certainly not riding quite as well. I think he's a bit heavier as well, looking at him. Um, certainly last week on the eve of the Vuelta, when we met up with him, I thought he was carrying probably a couple more kilos Packing a bit of than he was at the Tour de France. And um, So you've got him not as strong as he was at the Tour de France, and Quintana apparently stronger so the balance on, of power yeah, does seem to put on weight quite easily for him I mean you remember the test that he did last year uh, just on the eve of the Vuelta a few weeks after the tour and he'd put on a you know a few kilos since the tour and, and the other point I suppose we should make is that Movistar really bring their A team to the to the Vuelta it's a, a group of riders that have a lot of experience riding together have done a lot of big races together and team sky's welter lineup is really a bit of an assortment of um guys who do know and have ridden with chris Froome a, a lot and riders who simply needed a grand tour to, to round off their season or to fill a hole in their calendar um and i think they're probably still finding their feet together a little bit there's an interesting one as well because i mean they've lost mikhail kwiatkowski and um, leopold koenig is up to fifth overall that you know he obviously rode extremely well today peter kennick is still fairly highly placed overall now kennick is under contract next year i have a feeling that koenig isn't and that he may be on his way out at team sky and therefore He's he's he, he could be there could be an incentive for him to ride for himself as well. I think he's definitely on his way out, isn't he? Yeah. So you know, your Le Leopold Koenig. I don't know if he's got a contract for next year. You would think he would get one. He's fifth over on the Vuelta. There's potentially a very good result for him. Daniel, you can't nod in a podcast. That just doesn't work. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's not been the best of times for Leopold Koenig at, at Team Sky, has it? I mean, um, he got some freedom last year at the Giro d'Italia and rode pretty well and once once Richie Porte had pulled out of the race. Um, then he was taken to the Tour de France and I think there's been a bit of an issue there with how he's integrated with the rest of the team. I think certainly increasingly at Team Sky has been of a quite a strong block of British riders, not a clique, but a block, you know, good friends, guys who have ridden together for a number of years and I think Koenig's at times found it quite hard to penetrate that, mm. and I think he is a a, a a fairly a fairly reserved character, um, not the most gregarious character, and I think um, maybe not one for the bants. No, and maybe he would be better off somewhere else, and uh, maybe he will thrive in a different environment. That's my hunch. Well, he certainly thrived leading a small team, and perhaps that would be a, another an option for him to return to a smaller team and, and lead. But he's fifth overall in the Vuelta. He's riding extremely well. And as I said earlier, he looked cool as a cucumber at the top. It really didn't seem to have taken that much out of him. Let's leave it there, shall we, Daniel? We've got another big day tomorrow. Um, let's uh, return then. And Subida al Naranco, isn't it? The, the uh, famous... I'm one day at a time, Daniel. The I famous Naranco today. climb um, used to be the venue, used to be the... Uh, the, the finish, well, a very famous race, Subida and Naranco, was a one-day race won a few years ago by Roma Sicard when he was still an amateur. Um, has doesn't exist now as a professional race. I think I'm right in saying. I'm sure I'm Roman right in saying. Roma Sicard still exists as a professional rider and is riding the race. He, he does. And um, I suppose all, all eyes will be on, well, some eyes... Um, interested eyes will be on um, Samuel Sanchez tomorrow because he's from Oviedo, isn't he? And the race this finishes. Is his, yeah. The Naranco is um, the Oviedo climb par excellence. It just um, rises the above the above the city. Quite, he, a lot of people thought he was a Basque, didn't they? Because he rode for Uscatel for so long. He was a sort of ordinary Basque, but we're in the neighbouring region here, and this is his his hood. So let's see how he goes. In the meantime, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Richard.